Hi, my name is Jason Whitfield, and as part of a team here at EMBL for a Synthetic Bile in Action uh, project, I will be taking you through the genetic firewalls to horizontal gene transfer in an effort to greater understand synthetic biology and its emerging contribution to the society. So synthetic biology is a field that is marrying engineering, chemistry, and biology, building on efforts of people who have come before us in biology through the creation of sequencing and the genomics project to help us create new to nature functions whereby we can help microbes such as Pseudomonas butita create things such as biofuels to help us lessen our reliance on fossil fuel mechanisms that we currently use. Also to create therapeutic drugs to help us dispense with the messy and often time consuming and expensive methods that organic chemistry has given us. Further this, we can also create biosensors whereby we can actually selectively look for a molecule of interest in a biological system or even in the environment. And lastly, almost importantly, we can in fact do bioremediation, whereby we can clean up some of the pollution that has accrued over man's occupation. To do this, we need to be able to contain these genetically modified organisms that we're creating. The S. Aloma Conference in 1975 highlighted this, and since then, a lot of genetic and physical containment strategies have been put in place. And these largely rely on the idea that we keep bacteria in a lab or in a reactor. However, bacteria can transfer their DNA. This is a process known as horizontal gene transfer. This is when DNA from one organism is transferred to another, conferring that new function to the recipient organism. However, DNA can survive in the environment for months in the right condition. So even though an organism is dead, its DNA will still survive. And this, in fact, can be taken up also. And this really highlights the idea that we need to create genetic barriers to this uptake or conference of genetically modified function. This really highlights the need for us to create a genetic control mechanism by which we can prevent the spread of this DNA. And to do this, we need to go back at our basic biology. And this involves looking at DNA replication, which is a high fidelity process involving the concerted and complex interplay of a variety of enzymes and proteins to create conventional DNA replication. And this, however, is not always true. And sometimes mistakes can occur, whereby uracil can be misrecognized and therefore misincorporated into the DNA strand as thymine. And this occurs through a variety of mechanisms, most often governed by the ratio pool of ur uracil to thymine. However, there are enzymes involved in the cell that can actually regulate this process. They are DUTP nucleotide hydrolase. And this one, it, what it does is it actually converts UTP to the monophosphate variant, liberating pyrophosphate, and in doing so, sh shuttles it down the biosynthetic pathway towards thymine formation, thus lowering the pool and lowering misincorporation. Another process the cell has in this proofreading is UTP uracil DNA glycosylase. This enzyme moves along the DNA strand and flips out nucleotides, assessing their identities. And when it finds a uracil, it cleaves the backbone bonds, thus initiating the uracil repair response. So, Another mechanism that can also occur is the deamination of cytosine to the uracil, thus increasing the pool of uracil present in the cell and the level of misincorporation. So one of the kind of ethos of synth synthetic biology is to hijack these native functions and repurpose them. And so the idea for this project was to, cre to hijack this misincorporation process as a means of creating a genetic control in the organism Pseudomonas putida, to kind of create a new genetic language whereby we have a genetic firewall that ensures that if a plasmid is present in an organism, it'll be rich in uracil and its survival will be dependent on staying in that target host. And conversely, creating an organism that has a brittle genome which will accumulate these uracils and should it come into contact through mating or other methods with the copies of DUT and UNG, it will in fact be degraded. To look at the first example of these genetic firewalls in crumbly DNA, we have a case where we have a uracil-rich plasmid and via horizontal gene transfer is transferred to another organism. And rather in the usual case whereby the organism would confer this new function, the enzymes DUT and UNG present will actually recognize the uracil-rich DNA and thus degrade it, preventing any spread of the DNA. In the other case of genetic missile and lethal mating, we have an, a genome which is rich in uracil and should it undergo mating, with another organism or take up synthetic DNA from the environment that potentially contains these two enzymes, UNG and DUT, they will be expressed, hijacking the cell's own polymerase functionality and degrading the DNA. So 
this, this method was coined in the De Lorenzo lab, whereby you take your gene of interest, and you denoted here by the orange arrows, and you choose regions upstream and downstream, denoted as TS1 and TS2, to look to use as homologous regions later on. Then through conventional methods such as PCR, we can create a whole entire fragment that has these two regions. Then, following on from restriction digest and subsequent ligation, we can, use a, we can integrate them into a plasmid, which won't replicate in our host organism as it relies on a special polymerase, and therefore will actually integrate into the genome, hijacking the cell's own function of homologous recombination. And this works in such a way that when the plasmid enters, it will, by homologous recombination, it will identify with the TS1 domain, and through, we'll read through, and we'll actually see the entire plasmid incorporated into the genome. And now, due to the presence of specific restriction enzyme sites in both the plasmid and in other parts of the genome, we can actually induce the response of an endonuclease to cleave these sites, thus giving us two possibilities by which we can recombine the DNA. We can have the first situation, which is where TS2 recombines with TS2, or we can have the other situation, TS1 going to TS1. Now this occurs with a 50-50 probability in the cell, and what we have is either a gene deletion variant through the homologous recombination of the TS2 domains, or we can have the wild type through the recombination of the TS1 domains. And this is achieved through a very standard array of methods applied in the lab, so such as PCR, restriction ligation, and digestion, and antibiotic selection. And so it's a rather novel method using a combination of fairly standard techniques, which is kind of what is at the heart of synthetic biology. And through creating these gene deletion variants and allowing the uracil-rich incorporation DNA, we can actually do some basic analyses using fluorescence microscopy, relying on propidium iodide staining of DNA to check for the presence of our DNA before and after mating and before and after the incorporation of these two enzymes. We can also do flow cytometry to look at a cell-to-cell -cell basis to see the actual ratio we're getting of uracil incorporation to see whether we get a uniform homogeneous incorporation or whether there are actually changes that could affect the efficacy of this technique in creating um, genetic control. So what we've done here is take native functions in an organism and actually re repurpose them to create a means of genetic control to prevent the spread of our genetically modified DNA out into the environment. And that's really what's at the heart of synthetic biology, is taking a native function, redesigning and repurposing it for our own means, such that we could potentially improve our quality of life, save our environment, or help us to greater understand the intricacies of the world around us.